Hi, David from Electric Teaching here, and this lesson is about solving for imaginary solutions in a quadratic situation. So quadratic equations, when you try to solve, and you get square roots of negative solutions. So those are imaginary solutions. So I'm going to give you a lesson on how to deal with them and kind of a little bit on why we deal with them. Hopefully a little bit of why we deal with them. Excuse me, didn't mean to do that there. Um, let's see. Let's start by just an example problem of where this occurs. How about this one? x squared, x squared plus 4 equals 0. Remember that intersections are solutions. So the first thing I want you to do is get a visual of what this means. This wants to, this this solving for this is basically asking where does the x squared plus 4 parabola, the x squared plus 4 parabola, the parabola that crosses at 4, y intercept of 4, and where does that hit y equals 0? Way down here y equals 0 is the x-axis. So if you look at this, there are definitely no intersections. So therefore, there are no solutions. Well, technically, there are no real solutions. There are no real solutions. And that's important because if I was to try to solve this via algebra, let me undo the positive 4 and the x, uh, the square on the x. So let's see, I'll take x squared equal, let's subtract 4 from both sides. Okay, and now square root, square root both sides, a little basic algebra here. Whenever you take the square root, I try to remind my students always plus or minus the square root. Always plus or minus the square root. So x is equal to, I'm going to keep the plus or minus on the right side, it'll work out the same as long as you have it on one side, plus or minus the square root of negative 4. If you try to take out your calculator and try to figure out what this answer is, it'll say domain error or some type of other error. Kind of like the way the graph shows, there's no intersections. The calculator is looking for real solutions and there are none. So it'll say some sort of domain error. Well, that doesn't mean that they're not some sort of solutions to this that are in what we call an imaginary solution, where this hits a different type of access, basically. So let me factor this. I'm going to factor this. I'm going to take the negative 1, that's the negative sign, and basically break it apart from the 4, so that I show it as negative 1 times 4. In basic algebra, you might remember that as long as we're multiplying factors, we can break the square roots up onto each one, but only if we're multiplying. Now, this right here, it, the square root of negative one, which is the part of the is the is the the imaginary part, the domain air part, basically. This is something that we want to manipulate and move around and collect and multiply. And to make it easier, um, mathematicians, I think a few hundred years ago, decided to make this i. Decided to make the variable i out of this square root of negative 1. Okay? Over here, the square root of 4 is 2. Don't forget, we got our plus or minus coming down along the way, too. So we get solutions of plus or minus. 2i. I'm going to just put the 2 in front and the still is multiplied. The still is multiplied. So plus or minus 2i. Well, let me show you an example of how that is still a solution. If you think about this in factored form, and part of the book's problems have you multiplying out these, these uh, binomials with i in there. So if you think about this in factored form, if this is truly a solution, that means that these are factors using the zero property to make zero. Okay, I know that sounds like a lot, but think about this as simple factors. If this is a solution, and I think you've been factoring a lot recently, if you're asking about imaginary solutions, then the factors, the binomials multiplied, could easily look like this to be the equivalent statement. Well, let's see if it's true. Let's see if this is equivalent to the original. If I FOIL it, x squared, you may notice you have conjugate pairs, which are come or do come from difference of squares or do make difference of squares. I'll show it out though in FOILing. A positive 2, I'm going to write the x first, x, 
i, just the way they like to write it a lot, 2xi, that's a really bad i, sorry, minus a, outsides here, outsides and foiling, a 2xi, so first outside, inside, and now last is a negative times positive and 2 times 2, so negative 4 and then i times i, i squared. Hopefully you've foiled many a time so that that seems pretty normal. You can see that the 2xi and the negative 2xi are going to make 0. And what you now have left is x squared, but the negative 4 times i squared, well, if i, if i is, as I have down here, the uh, square root of negative 1, and we square both sides of this, if we square both sides of this, then that would give me, let's just kind of do that, i squared would give me the square of negative, uh, square root of negative 1. So then i squared, i squared must be, must be, squares cancel the square root, a negative 1. So now this is negative 1 times the negative 4. Therefore, you can see the final answer here is x squared, when we multiply it out to check, plus 4. And it does check. Whoops, that last plus 4 was pretty sloppy. Let me get my pen going better there. My pen going better there. Hang on, a little sloppy there. So what we want to do is have, it, what we've shown is, we've shown that this takes us right back. So even though there are no real solutions, no real intersections, these factors, these solutions, these are solutions, excuse me, these imaginary ideas are solutions because they do come back and make the original equation. So because of that, we have to learn how to manipulate and solve and simplify and do other things. So I'd like to do a little bit right here of just practicing simplify. If we let i be the square root of negative 1, then you might remember working with radicals, we can find square values in here and, and factor them out of the square root. Let me show you what I mean. If I take 27 to be 9 times 3, because 9 is a square value, rewrite it then, this is equal to the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 9. Because I can multiplying all these factors and then a negative 1 as well, if I'm multiplying all these factors to make a negative 27, and as long as they're multiplied, the radicals can break up. Now you can see simplified, this is the i, there's the real part, 3, and this is uh, 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 another real part, root 3. Irrational, can't make a fraction out of it, but still real. So the final answer is 3, excuse me, 3 root 3i, 3 root 3i. We like to put the imaginary part um, last, the i part last. It's kind of like the little variable part last. All right, let's try the next one. Inside of here, you can see we're going to have a 2 and a 25. I'm looking for square values, so I'm thinking of my sixth grade prime factorization trees. You might remember those. And technically a negative 1. So if you multiply these out, you get negative 50. If you think of square roots on each one, if you think of square roots on each one of these factors, then you're going to get a, a 5 from here, 5. A root 2 is another real part, um, irrational, no fraction, but real. And the imaginary part, i for the square root of negative 1. And this one over here, let's do example C. 6 is already simplified, nothing really to do here. I'm going to try to factor 108. Seems like a big number, so I think the rules for divisible by 4, if the last two digits go into the number, then 4 will go into it. So I'm pretty sure 4 will go into it based on that rule. We're going to get the negative 1. We're going to get the negative 1. That didn't come out right. Let me fix that real quick. We're going to get the negative 1 as one factor. And then I think a 4 comes out of it. And if I divide 4 into 10, that's 2 times. That's 8. Leaves a 2 remainder, 28. Yep, 27. 27 times 4 should be 108. And then if I factor again, just like a little factor tree, I think I'm running out of room here. Let me move this over just a little bit. So if I factor again here, then what I'm looking for is 
think, a 3 and a 9, a 3 and a 9. So since 9 and 4, excuse me, 4 and 9 are two square numbers, then the multiply of them, 36, that's the other square number. So now if I simplify this, I got 6 plus the square root of negative 1, the square root of 9 times 4, 36, and what's stuck inside? The square root left inside is the root 3. The 3 is left inside. 6 plus 6 root 3 i. More vocabulary. This is called a complex, a complex value. A complex value. It has, a, a, it has the form of a plus b i. a plus b i, where a and b are real values on the number line. I is the imaginary part. So BI here is basically the imaginary part, but it has a real multiplier. Keep that in mind. So this is the real part, and this is the imaginary part, the whole imaginary part with the I term. Okay, And they actually are, have some applications in things like fractals and upper division, upper division mathematics course. But I just want to um, have you have that. Keep, keep that idea in mind. As I was doing these uh, um, simplifying, excuse me, if I was as I was simplifying these expressions, please always remember that the principal square root, when given in question, in a question, excuse me, I wrote that wrong, in a question, only the positive, not plus or minus, is considered. So these are all positive, or what we call principal square roots given. So they're not plus or minus answers. Don't get confused with them. A little conversation more about eyes. They have a neat little pattern when you start multiplying um, more eyes to each side. For instance, if we multiply by i and i, in other words, squaring each side, as we saw before, we're going to get i squared is equal to negative 1. If we actually multiply by an i on both sides, we're going <clears> to <throat> go up by a degree, excuse me, and we're going to get now i cubed, i cubed on one side. And negative 1 times i, or negative i, on the other side. Neat little pattern coming out. If I multiply by i again on each side, if I multiply by i again on each side, you're going to see then we're going to get i to the fourth, i to the fourth. Okay, so now we have i to the fourth, and we're going to get negative i times i. So i to the fourth is equal to negative i squared, negative i squared. Negative i times i or negative i squared. But wait a minute, that's the same as since i squared's negative 1 is negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. Well, that didn't come out well, sorry about that. Which is positive 1. So now we've learned that if we get all the way to negative 4, I mean, excuse me, i to the fourth, we're at the positive value of 1. And if we multiply by i again on both sides, and we get to i to the fifth, and we get to i to the fifth, then we are back to, let's see, 1 times i, and i is negative, square root of negative 1, or i. And if I again go through the pattern and multiply by i's, I'll get to i to the sixth, but that should be the same as i squared by the pattern. So teachers love to ask questions like, what is i to the 16th? Well, i to the 16th, it seems on the 4th, and then later on the 8th, and all the multiples of 4 seem to be coming back to 1. So i to the 16th is the same as i to the 40th, or i to the 80th, and is 1. And if you go to anywhere in between, 2nd, 3rd, 4th after that, 17, 18, 19, you're going to be going through the same pattern. So teachers love to ask questions of like, what is i to the 107th? So keep that in mind. Well, I'm David from Electric Teaching, and this is part one. I'm going to show you part two and do more of the solving that we did before to really get an idea of the application. Again, this is kind of learning, as I, call it, as I tell my students, dance steps for the bigger picture in pre-calculus and calculus. Uh, but the application to fractals, electronics, there's a lot of neat little things as you get up into upper level stuff. My name is David from Electric Teaching. I hope that this has helped.